Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you so much for joining me this evening. Tonight, in honor of Halloween, we are talking about Egyptian mummies. Now, today, mummies are probably the most famous product of ancient Egypt, along with the pyramids. And we all know about movie mummies, where they can be scary or silly, but we're going to be talking about real life mummies. And I'm betting that most, if not all of you, are here because you're already interested in mummies, and maybe you already know quite a bit about them. But hopefully I can still still tell you something new. We're going to learn not only what they are and how they were made, but also why mummies were made. Why was it so important to the ancient Egyptians to preserve the body after death? We'll even talk about what's happened to some mummies long after they were buried, after they were rediscovered thousands of years later. Now I'm going to show you some pictures of mummies, and they can be a little startling, um, especially for younger viewers. And so whenever you see this symbol uh, in the corner of the screen, it means that a photograph of a mummy is coming up next, just to give you some warning. And again, I'm definitely not going to show you anything intentionally disturbing. So what are mummies? Well, when a person or animal dies, their skin, muscles, heart, everything rots away until it's just the skeleton. And then the skeleton disintegrates into dust over time. When a dead body is mummified, some of that tissue that would normally decay is instead dried out and preserved. Sometimes even hair and clothing are preserved and we can still even see tattoos or scars. This process of preservation can be done intentionally, in which case it's called embalming. Uh, or it can be done unintentionally or through natural causes, through the environment. Natural mummification can happen in wet or in dry conditions. In wet mummification, the body is in an environment that keeps bacteria and other organisms away, like being stuck in ice or in a bog where there's no oxygen. In dry mummification, as you can guess, all the moisture gets sucked out of the body, which keeps it from decaying. And this often happens when bodies are buried in hot, dry sand. Then there is artificial or anthropogenic, that is human-caused mummification, which is called embalming. And different peoples throughout history and around the world have found different ways of keeping the body from breaking down and decaying. Uh, an ancient Chilean tribe called the Chincharo, the Inca, the Maori, and the ancient Egyptians are just a few examples. Now, usually we find that mummies show signs of being both naturally and artificially made, where the body would be treated, but it also depended upon special environmental conditions. The ancient Egyptians were not the first to practice mummification, uh, but they did do it for the longest period of time, thousands of years in fact, and their funerary rites were very elaborate. So just to put this in perspective, here is a timeline that shows Egyptian history within the context of human cultural activity. So the first clear work of art that we know of is from around 40,000 years ago. The last ice age ended around 8,000 years ago. And everything from the earliest Egyptian mummies to us today occurred in this little bit of space right here. Now, zooming in, we can see that modern archaeologists have divided ancient Egypt into different periods or kingdoms. These are divisions that are made to help us keep track of Egypt Egyptian history. The ancient Egyptians themselves didn't use these periods. It wasn't like they went to bed in the Middle Kingdom and woke up one day and they're like, yay, it's the beginning of the new kingdom but they just are helpful for us to measure time. And this whole time right here is when the Egyptians practiced mummification. So that's almost 4,000 years, quite a long time. Now we think that the Egyptians probably got the idea for mummification when they noticed that the hot desert sands preserved the bodies buried there, but we're learning that they began using artificial methods a lot earlier than we used to think. So this is an early Egyptian burial from around 7, 3700 BC. You can see that the deceased man was buried with a few objects. He has his arm folded and his knees are drawn up to the chest. And it was believed that this was a natural mummy that was produced by the hot dry sands until 2018 when a team discovered embalming chemicals on the textiles that were used to wrap the body, showing that there was intentional mummification occurring as well. Now, over time, mummification methods became more sophisticated and tombs and funerary objects became more elaborate. 
Now, for a long time, only the pharaoh, his family, and the hiring king, priests, and officials could afford to have their bodies mummified after death. But over the centuries, this changed to include people of lower rank, too. They put a lot of time and effort into these funerary arrangements. And in fact, most of our information about the ancient Egyptians comes from their tombs. So why was this so important? Well, the ancient Egyptians believed that when a person's body died, the spirit lived on in the realm of the gods. This place was called the Field of Reeds, and it was pretty much just like Egypt, but without bad things like sickness, and the grain grew taller, and people's ancestors were there, so it sounds pretty nice. But to reach the Field of Reeds, you had to have all kinds of magical help, and your body had to be preserved so that it could be restored in the afterlife. Now, the New Kingdom is what we might call the Golden Age of Mummification. And as we just saw, the ancient Egyptians practiced mummification for thousands of years, and they kept excellent records, thousands of which have survived. And we go to them to learn a lot about life in the ancient Mediterranean. If we can't inf find information elsewhere, usually the Egyptians wrote something down about it. Yet in all of the records that have survived, we only have four documents that talk about mummification. Two of them don't say anything about the embalming process at all. They just talk about when different funerary rituals were supposed to be performed. A third document tells us the order in which the mummy's limbs should be wrapped. And then a fourth tells us some of the oils that were used to treat the body, but nothing about the process itself. Instead, our information about mummification used to be mostly from an ancient Greek historian named Herodotus, who was writing in the 5th century BC. He wasn't a specialist in mummification at all, and he probably wasn't allowed to witness the process, but he did travel to Egypt and interviewed a lot of people, and he tried to be really objective about it. He did a lot of research. Now, however, researchers can also use the latest medical technology to study mummies. We have things like x-rays and CAT scans and 3D modeling to tell us a lot about who these people were, what their lives were like, how they died, and how their bodies were preserved. Now, let's go through the steps of how to make a mummy, the way it would have been done for a pharaoh in the New Kingdom. Because the pharaoh was so important, his body got the best and most elaborate treatment. And while the pharaoh is still alive, lots and lots of preparations are made to make sure that everything will be ready by the time he dies. We have a tomb and a mortuary temple are built, and the pharaoh hires thousands of artisans and workers to create everything that he's going to be, need to be prepared for the afterlife. Once the pharaoh dies, the embalming has to start right away, because any delay would harm the preservation of the body. Now, just a heads up, this next part is about to get kind of gross. So if you don't want to hear the gory details, you can just mute this presentation and unmute when you see this symbol pop up in the corner. So if you'd like to do this, then go ahead and hit mute now. Now, for those of you who are still with me, the first step is to remove the brain. You've probably heard that this was done by pulling the brain out of the nose using an iron hook, but it's a little more complicated than that. In 2000, some researchers tested Herodotus' instructions on a cadaver, and they found that it was pretty difficult to remove the brain. Instead of just putting an iron hook through the nose, you have to have the iron hook and then a hammer to break through the bone in each nostril. Then they mixed up the brain matter for 20 minutes. Then they poured liquid through the nose into the brain cavity and turned the body face down to let it drain out. Now, after doing this a few times, they finally had an empty skull. The next step is to take out all of the other internal organs. This was done by making a two to three inch incision to the left of the belly button and then removing everything except for the heart. The heart was a really important part of the person's identity. It was believed to be the container of thought and memory and intelligence, and it was necessary during the journey to the field of reeds, so it had to stay with the body. Most of the other squishy parts uh, were thrown out, but the liver, stomach, intestines, and lungs were all carefully set aside. 
These were rinsed, packed in salt to make them dry out, and then stored in containers called canopic jars. Each of these organs was protected by one of the four sons of the god Horus, who are represented on the jar lids. There's a falcon, a human, a jackal, and a baboon head. So now that all of the squishy wet insides are out of the body, it still needs to be dried out. This will keep the skin, muscles, and bones from completely decaying. But since the human body is like 99% water, this takes a long time, about 35 days in fact. So for a full month, the body is covered up with a salt called natron. And just as an aside, Herodotus said that it uh, took 70 days, but modern scientists have found that if you do a full 70 days, the body gets really stiff so that you can't bend it for the wrapping process. 35 days is just about right. And we're not done yet. After the natron gets rinsed off, the mummy is still flexible enough to be moved, but now that it's all dried out and empty, it doesn't look quite right. So they might stuff it with a little bit of linen to make it look fuller. Then the mummy gets sewn closed and it's time for wrapping. Now in the old kingdom, each of the arms and legs were wrapped separately. Here we go. Arms and legs wrapped separately. There we go. But they later changed so that the linen strips wrap around the whole body. This takes a long time because while the mummy is being wrapped, special priests are doing rituals and saying spells that are supposed to protect the mummy and the dead person's spirit and help them reach the field of reeds. So while they wrap, they also put good luck charms called amulets into the bandages. One of the most common types of amulets looks like this. It's a representation of the god of the air, Shu. Shoe amulets were placed on the torso, probably to protect the lungs so that they could breathe when the spirit reaches the field of reeds. Another common amulet is the Eye of Horus, or a wadget. This was placed on the mummy's forehead to protect them from evil. Now that our mummy is finished, there were a lot of different ways of decorating it, depending on the time period and who the person was and how wealthy or important they were. Here's the head from a mummy of a governor named Jehudinacht. Governor Jehudinacht was mummified and buried in a tomb with lots of cool stuff, but unfortunately at some point his tomb was looted and all of the valuables taken away. His mummy was destroyed except for the head is the only thing that survives. <clears throat> Now another, <clears throat> excuse me, <laughs> um, in this example, and with Governor Jehudi Knox's head, we can see the linen wrapping on the outside, the paint for the eyebrow, the mummy with the adhered linen fibers underneath. Now another technique is what's today called cartonnage. And cartonnage is layers of linen and glue, kind of like paper mache. And they put this all over the mummy to make a protective case, which then they'd paint. Here's an example of one of these cartonnage mummy cases, and you can see that it was damaged. So the mummy is underneath, and here you can see how thick the cartonnage is. Then you can see the wrappings on the mummy, and the intact portion of the cartonnage is painted with various symbols. Now, later on, it was common for a mummy to just be uh, wrapped in a sheet that's held on with linen bands like you see here. This one is covered in a net made of beautiful blue faience beads. And there are also four amulets that are sewn into the net. They're the four sons of Horus, the guardians of the internal organs that are placed in the canopic jars we saw earlier. In later times, instead of putting the organs in the jars, they'd wrap them up and put them back in the body. Now, this particular mummy is pretty cool because not only is the mummy and its wrappings in great shape, but we also have the cases that held it. A mummy case is called a sarcophagus, which is a Greek word that means eater of the dead. Pretty cool. So the mummy goes into this sarcophagus, and then they go into this one. And then they all go into this coffin, 
Sitting on top is a jackal. So it's not just any jackal though, it's Anubis, the god of mummification and the guide and protector of the dead. Now this coffin and the final sarcophagus are really well made, they're high quality, but they're not very fancy. For mummies of very important and wealthy people, they might have lots of sarcophagi that are very fancy and very elaborate. One of the reasons we're having multiple coffins or sarcophagi was you could put more spells on it to protect the dead. It also protected the mummy better physically by giving different layers. And finally, it was a way of showing wealth or prestige that you were important enough to have so many different sarcophagi. Here's an example of a really huge sarcophagus that belonged to a military general named Kefera. It's made of stone and it's incredibly heavy and tall. Now, you'll notice that there's lots of writing on these sarcophagi and coffins. These are all spells and messages to the gods to help the deceased spirit. This is the coffin of Governor Jehudinacht, whose mummified head we saw earlier. Notice that on the outside of this coffin, there are two eyes of Horus. Now, this is really interesting because on the other side of the same panel, there's a painting of a door. The mummy laying in the coffin would be on its side facing in this door, which would allow the spirit to leave the body or the cot in the coffin and travel outside the tomb. This part of the spirit that could travel to and from the mummy was called the ba, and it was depicted as a bird with a human head, which indicated its ability to fly, to fly around. The ba wasn't the only part of the spirit, though. The ancient Egyptians believed that once a person died, their being split into different parts. The most important were the ba and the ka, which is the part of the person that had to travel through the underworld to reach the field of reeds. This was a really dangerous and difficult journey, and when the ka got there, it needed to have a body, which is why the body was so carefully preserved and covered in protective amulets. This gold sheet, for example, was placed on the tongue to make sure that it, the spirit could talk. With... Now here's where it gets really interesting. During the Old Kingdom, the pharaohs built massive tombs that we know of as the pyramids. These are just piles of bricks that only had rooms inside for the mummy and the things that the spirit would need. They and all ancient Egyptian tombs are built on the left or western bank of the Nile. When the pharaoh died, his body was carried across the Nile River on a barge. The mummification took place at a special temple on the banks of the Nile before the mummy was taken into the pyramid and sealed up in the tomb. Now this is pretty cool because during excavations near the pyramids, archaeologists found where boats had been buried. This is Here's the place on the left where the boat was found, and in the middle, sorry, on the right, is a reconstruction of what it would have looked like. Why is this cool? Well, because the sun rises in the east and sets in the west, and during its journey across the sky, the ancient Egyptians believed that it traveled in a boat carried by the scarab god Kefre. Every day, Kefre would take the sun across the sky but every night, the sun had to go through the darkness of the underworld, or the Duat. The Duat was a dangerous place full of monsters and demons, but worst of all was the serpent god of chaos, Apep, who tried to eat the sun and plunge the world into eternal darkness. So every night was a battle between good and evil, order and chaos, and light and darkness. Apep was so feared, in fact, that he was never shown or his name ever written unless he was shown being defeated by one of the gods. Now, this picture on the left is pretty cool. It's a cat using a knife to cut off Apep's head. But this isn't just any cat. This is the sun god, Ra. Ra took on many different forms, including a scarab like Kefre or a cat like we see here, depending on what job he was doing. So just like we have the sun moving from east to west and fighting through the Duat to rise again, the deceased traveled across the Nile and then through the underworld and past Apep to reach the field of reeds. Luckily, the deceased is entombed with a whole bunch of spells that will help him. Today we call these spells the Book of the Dead, but there wasn't a standard book. People could choose what spells they wanted to have written down for them. In fact, we know of 192 different spells.
This papyrus in the collection of the Cleveland Museum of Art belonged to a man named Hori. At the beginning, we see Hori's body being mummified, watched over by Anubis and the goddesses Isis and Nephthys who mourn Hori's death. In the bottom left are the four guardians of the stomach, lungs, intestines, and liver. Notice that unlike Anubis, they don't have legs. That's because they're represented as mummies that are wrapped up. And to the right, watched over by both the jackal of Anubis and the eye of Horus is Hori's mummy. And in the bottom right corner is the Hori's ba, depicted as a bird with a human head next to his mummy. After that, Hori has to get past 14 gates, each guarded by gods and demons holding knives and ready to cut Hori to pieces if he answers their questions wrong or if he's found wanting in some way. Here's another papyrus from a musician named Nani who worked in the temple of the god Amun. We see her on the right holding up an instrument called a sistrum. At one point in her collection of spells, Nani has to get past a lake of fire guarded by four baboons. Above, Thoth, the ibis-headed god of scribes, writes down the results of Nani's tests. And just to the right, Nani lays down in reverence before a disc representing the sun. The most dramatic moment in the spirit's journey through the duat is the weighing of the heart. Nani's heart is on the left side of the scale, being weighed against Mat or truth on the right. Sometimes you'll see that Maat is referred to as the goddess of truth, but it's really a lot more complicated than that. Maat was an idea or a state of an existence. It's truth, order, balance, correctness. It's the way things should be. It's the opposite, really, of Apep. Now above, on top of the scales, is the scribe god Poth, shown here as a baboon, recording the results of the weighing. Anubis below reads off the results of this, the weighing. And he says in the hieroglyphics, her heart is an accurate witness, meaning that Nani's heart is in accordance with Maat and she's passed the test. Osiris answers, since her heart is an accurate witness, give her her eyes and her mouth. And in the orange circle here, you can see in the hieroglyphs, these two, three symbols representing eyes and a mouth, which are also in Nani's hand showing that she's received them. Now Nani can move on to the field of reeds as a complete person, having all of her senses restored. Here's another representation of the wing of the heart. We don't know the name of the deceased in this case, but we can see him on the left approaching the scales, which are here being overseen by Horus, uh, by Anubis on the left and Horus on the right. And again, we have the a heart on the left side of the scale and the feather of Maat on the right and the little baboon sitting on top. But here we also see what happens if the test is not passed. The monster sitting on top of the column will devour the soul. Thankfully, we know that the deceased man has passed the test because on the right, we see his mummy wrappings being removed, revealing his restored body. The mummification process has worked. And at his feet are the canopic jars that have been keeping his organs safe for just this moment. Now, while the deceased is enjoying the afterlife in the field of reeds, what's happening to their mummies? One of the strangest episodes relating to mummies happened in the Renaissance. There's a naturally occurring petroleum substance called bitumen that was sometimes used in the preservation of mummies. In Persian, this is mumia, in Arabic mumia, and in Latin mumia, which came to English as mummy. Now the word mumia refers both to bitumen, the substance, and to the mummified body. It seems that at some point, an Arab doctor recommended bitumen as a treatment for certain diseases. Unfortunately, this became mistranslated as mumia, the mummy, and so ground up mummy parts are sometimes found in old apothecary collections in Europe as a medicine to be taken orally. Mummies were also unfortunately used in the night 18th and 19th centuries 
to produce a pigment for paint. Here you see two tubes of mummy brown produced by the paint supplier Robertson and Company in London. A really interesting episode regarding this paint comes from the uh, stories of Rudyard Kipling, who was nephew to Edward Byrne Jones, whose work you see here on the right. According to Kipling, when Edward Byrne Jones found out that Mummy Brown actually contained mummies, he immediately went up to his studio, got his tube of paint, and insisted that they give it a proper burial in the garden. Now, the great event in European history that launched interest in Egypt happened in 1798 when the, the French invaded Egypt. Napoleon Bonaparte, who was not emperor at this point, led an expedition to Egypt with not only his military staff, but also a large collection of intellectuals, scholars, artists, all there to help him to study all of the ancient remains of the country. Among the different artifacts that they found was this stone called the Rosetta Stone after the English name of the place where it was found. Now this is just a stone with kind of a normal declaration on it. The uh, pharaoh is making an announcement about some sort of worshiping protocol. But what's interesting is that it's written in three different languages. In hieroglyphs, in Demotic script, which was kind of like um, fan non-fancy hieroglyphs. Hieroglyphs were really hard to read and really formal, and Demotic script was kind of like shorthand. It was like what you wrote in normally. You wrote your grocery list in Demotic script. And then it's also written in the bottom in Greek. Now at this time, hieroglyphs could not be read. No one knew how to read them. But a French scholar named Jean-Francois Champollion was able to decipher hieroglyphs using the Greek portion of the text. Because he could read ancient Greek, he was able to decipher the other parts. This is the birth of the sort of modern uh, movement of art, uh, Egyptology. But of course, everyone was just now learning about Egypt and ancient Egypt. And one of the strange things that happened in the 19th century was the appearance of mummy unwrappings. In England, the premier mummy unwrapper was this man, Thomas Pettigrew, who was an amateur uh, Egyptologist. Now, it sounds quite strange to say that you had mummy unwrapping parties, and it is strange, but you have to remember that there were no archaeologists at this point. Everyone was just learning at, about it for the first time. So people would go to Egypt and buy a mummy, and they were just sold there um, by people who would loot the tombs. Uh, and then the mummy would be brought back to England, and you would invite some, you know, well-educated friends over and slowly unwrap the mummy and study it and study the amulets that were inside it, the types of writings that were on the linen wrappings and so forth. This didn't just happen in England, it also happened in France. We have another painting here showing the examination of a mummy. And again, you have to remember that these were all people who were the early Egyptologists, who were early archaeologists. They didn't have the types of tools that we have now to study mummies, where we don't have to unwrap the body and damage the mummy or its remains. Now we're continuing to learn so much about who these people were and what their lives were like, thanks to all this technology that we have. Now, if you're in the Cleveland area, I strongly encourage you to go to the CMI because they have a great collection of Egyptian art, including that scroll of Hori that we looked at earlier. Thank you so much for joining me to talk about Egyptian mummies, and I really hope that you enjoyed it. Thank you.